This is the current federal tax developments for the week of July the 6th, 2020. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state Society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona here, where it's going to be a nice toasty day. Uh, and we're going to talk this week about a number of developments that hit us in the area of taxes. We're going to talk a little bit about a IRS clarification on the payroll tax deferrals after we got the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act. We're going to discuss some COVID-19 related relief for taxpayers who may have been sponsoring a Safe Harbor 401k plan and now may decide they want to kind of reduce that contribution or eliminate it. We'll talk about those options. We'll talk about the IRS's memorandum related to a marketed program that claimed to get rid of capital gain taxation by using a charitable remainder annuity trust that would then purchase a single premium immediate annuities. And we'll discuss a lot more about some about why that program doesn't work for the IRS and actually as far as I'm concerned doesn't work but more interestingly discuss some of the problems we see quite often with these marketed programs and the supposed support that they give for the for the person trying to sell it to to give to their tax advisor to convince them and it's a neat smoke and mirrors game so we'll talk a little bit about that as we look at that background we'll also take a look here about uh, statute limitations rules that relate to superseding returns and that'll give us a chance to discuss a little bit the whole concept of you know, what is a superseding return? Why do I care about it? You know, and what, what, what should we do about that? We'll talk about that whole superseding return I information. We're going to talk about some changes, too, with the July 15th date. We'll talk about an IRS release telling us we will not get another, will not get another extension, at least per the IRS at this point. And we'll also, though, talk about the fact that a deadline we thought had passed on June 30th, turns out the IRS came in and told us at the last minute that it would not end on June the 30th, but in fact, we get all the way to July 15th. And so we'll talk about those issues as we move forward uh, with these items today. So let's talk about what we've got. Let's start with the first issue, which is pretty easy. We're going to have a change on the IRS website that went up on the 26th of June. It's their webpage talking about deferral of employment tax deposits and payments through December 31st of 2020. And all the IRS did on this website was reminded us of a change. They have these frequently asked questions. We discussed last week the frequently asked questions about the employee retention credit. Well, this is the one for the deferral of the old age survivor and disability insurance that was allowed to be, uh, you know, where you did not have to make those payments on the employer portion through the end of 2020. But under the original CARES Act, that only happened if you did not get a forgiveness of your loan under the payroll protection program loan program or paycheck protection program loan programs. If you got a PPP loan and you got the debt forgiven as of the date of forgiveness, you no longer could make the deferral. Well, the paycheck protection program flexibility act changed those rules. And as I said, at this point, we no longer lose the ability to defer that old age survivor and disability insurance if we get the PPP forgiveness. And they are going to remind us now that we now have that right to do it. It still does not change the fact that you don't get access to the employee retention credit. And this wasn't just after forgiveness, if you got a PPP loan at all. Now later we discovered if you paid it back by the three time extended date to throw it back in and we'll pretend you never got one, except for purposes if you try to get another one, uh, PPP loan repayment date, uh, but if you didn't meet those dates, then you cannot get the ERC. But the deferral of the payroll tax, you have the right to do that. Now remember, the problem with that program your client's going to run into is, great, they end up not sending a lot of money in for through the end of December. They end up, those employer taxes end up staying in their account, which, you know, overall, that's, that, that's good news, shall we say. But the bad news is that December 31st of 2021 and December 31st of 2022, they're going to pay half of what they deferred back on each of those dates. Is a no interest loan. The problem is, will they remember they've got that payment coming and will they track it properly? And yeah, all those things they have to remember on the 941s coming up. So again, the IRS did say that you don't have to do it. If you decide you're not going to go for the 
deferral, you just don't go for it. You just go ahead and make your deposits like normal. If you want to take advantage of deferral, you do the reduced deposit. And all of this is going to be reported on the new 941s, which, oh, by the way, now, yeah, this is the month we have to start worrying about those new 941s. So, you know, get yourself ready to go on that. Well, next up, let's talk about a change we did get this year. Notice 2020-52, or I should say this week. It came on June the 29th. And what we're looking at here is you all probably remember, if you know, you should recall that Normally, if you sponsor a 401k program or any other sort of deferral program, 403bs, etc., uh, we have these two tests called the, you know, basically the app, the two tests we end up here is with, let me get this right here, the ADP, the actual deferral percentage test, and the ACP, the actual contribution percentage test. And what those tests serve to do is limit the ability of the highly compensated to make a contribution deferral into a 401k unless the rank and file are contributing at least a reasonably close amount. You know, there's a certain add-on on top and, you know, there are ways to compute that, etc. But what happens often in small companies is because there are so few employees, the actions of one or two rank and file can have a major impact and reduce the ability of the highly compensated to make the contribution. And because that's so uncertain, a lot of small companies just decided that 401ks weren't worth it, or at least they weren't worth it and we do something else for the owners uh, because they really couldn't count on this benefit. So a number of years ago, back in the 90s, we got this thing added called a safe harbor 401k. In a safe harbor 401k, if you make either a across the board flat contribution to everybody who's eligible to participate in the plan, that's non forfeitable put that in their account, or if the employer makes what's called a qualifying match, which is a match that does not go up as deferral goes up, you know, and it has to meet certain minimum percentages, then you have this thing called a safe harbor 401k. And the good news is there we don't need to do ACP ADP testing. But the bad news is we are stuck with having committed to putting money into what's essentially a profit sharing plan, either just automatically for everybody, or we're committed to having to put the money in for anybody that defers. Now, with the economic problems we're having today, some companies are going to want to, you know, back off of those particular commitments. And this notice gives us a, you know, couple of options. One it does is it blesses the ability to have a reduction of the safe harbor for the highly compensated employees only, and that will not be considered a potential disqualifying event. So what it can do is, you know, yeah, okay, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to go ahead and make that 3% contribution on behalf of, you know, all of my rank and file employees. I'm not talking about reducing that, but, you know, I really don't want to bankrupt the company, you know, or put the company in a cash, in more of a cash flow pinch uh, by putting money into the accounts of the owners. Right. When the owners then are going to have to dig into their own pockets and loan the company money back in order to pay for the amount that's going in. So I'd like to just stop that as a way to save some money. Well, this basically opens up that possibility if you meet the terms of the notice. So that's useful. Now, all of these only apply to if you make these changes and modify your plan from March 13th, 2020. That was when the emergency was declared through August 31st of 2020. Okay. If you make the changes within that issue, you suspend or reduce things during that period, then you're covered by this ruling. Now, the other issue is, okay, no, no, I need to go broader. I mean, I, I, I can't afford to make this contribution. I can't afford to do these matches anymore. So bottom line, we're going to allow you middle of the year to make this. Now, normally, in order to make a mid-year uh, change in the plan, you had to have notified everybody ahead of time, you know, before the year started that you might change it in the middle of the year. And then you also have to give like a minimum of 60 days notice before you implement it. And the only exception would be if you were in financial distress. Well, as long as you make these elections to suspend or reduce the contributions and you do it between March 13th of 2020 and August 31st of 2020, 
then we're going to deem at this point that everybody has the economic emergency. So you're going to, you won't have to do any proof, not to worry about you know, showing your problem. We're just going to deem that you can do it, right? And the 60-day notice rule will be waived, but only for those plans that were using the non-elective across-the-board 3% contribution. The notice says, you know, here's the catch. If you're doing matching, well, that is going to have a direct impact on people's decisions to continue to defer the plan. So you will still have to give that 60-day notice and allow employees to change the deferrals uh, if you're going to be changing the match, and you're going to have to match for that 60 days. So if you're trying to change a match, you can do it, but it's going to be 60 days out. If you're trying to change a, you know, across the board, you literally can say, starting today, any wages after today, we're simply not going to make the 3% across the board contribution. Now, this also applies to 403B plans. So if you have a 403B plan that is a safe harbor plan, you can use this rule. Again, if you need. Now, remember, once you've done this, you've lost your safe harbor. So that does mean the highly compensated are going to be subject to this across the board test. So, you know, so if you do this reduction or elimination, we're going to lose our safe harbor treatment. Uh, but the theory is that, yeah, you know, we're not worried about that. And I suspect the idea is that the highly compensated right now, we're just trying to survive. We're not really worried about the savings for retirement until the company gets back in shape that it looks like we're going to, we're not going to be forced into retirement in the next two weeks. So yeah, that's the point of this. That's why it goes. And so if you need it, obviously it's there. It does retroactively apply, obviously, because March 13th is, it's, it's a while back, right? So you wonder why that's the date. Well, it will apply retroactively if you had made such a change, like to suspend the 3% contribution after that date. What it really will do in that case is it will eliminate the issue of being worried about being challenged on you didn't have an economic event. You didn't have something that economically forced it. So that's really the nice part about that. Next up, we're going to talk about, in this case, Memorandum AM 2020-006 issued on June the 26th. And this talks about a marketed tax shelter, okay? Uh, the marketed tax shelter told people that if you invested, let's say you've got this, you're going to have this huge capital gain. Maybe you're selling a piece of, you know, real estate that you've owned for decades. Maybe you're going to be selling your company, but you're going to have this really, really large capital gain. So what they suggest is we can solve this problem for you. And the memorandum tells people that what you're going to do is you're going to contribute the asset that you're going to recognize this huge gain on to a charitable remainder annuity trust. The trust then will sell that particular piece of you know property or stock or whatever, right? Trigger the gain. Now, memorandum says, which is correct, that a charitable remainder annuity trust, unless the sale was fully prearranged, in which case then you have an assignment of income problem. So please remember that about CR, any sort of charitable remainder trust. You cannot, you know, the whole deal can't be done because if the whole deal's done uh, at a certain point, you're at the point of no return and it's going to be assignment of income and you won't be able to, def to ignore the gain. But the CRAT pays no tax on the capital gain. The memo then goes on to say, well, CRATs can, you know, we have these rulings the IRS gave that allows a CRAT to pay charitable contributions, you know, out of the CRAT funds ahead of the date when they were supposed to be paid, you know, the remainder when the CRAT ends. For those not used to chair, a charitable remainder annuity trust works like this. I figure I better describe this because, you know, you need to understand what these things are. Charitable remainder annuity trust is a, you make a contribution to the trust, right? The trust then pays you a fixed annuity for a period of years or life. And if you arrange it, you're allowed a deduction for the present value of that future remainder interest. Because what it says is, we're going to pay you th this annuity payment for life of a certain percentage of what you put in. At the end of the term, either your death or at the end of a term certain. And if you're too young, you can't get it to your death and have the numbers work the way they have to. 
uh, so it may be a term of years. At the end of that term, the whatever's remaining in the CRAT goes to the charity. Okay? And that present value has to be at least, has to be greater than 10% of the initial contribution. You know, it has to be computed to be that. Obviously, the actual ways the investment inside the CRAT work are going to determine whether or not what we really have at the end. But using the discounting, using the IRS discount tables, we assume there'll be, you know, we, we compute that we, you know, the present value is at least 10%. So what they say is, okay, we make this contribution, and like I say, CRATs themselves don't pay tax. So we make the contribution, it sells it, pays no tax, reinvests the entire proceeds in a single premium annuity. Then the memo says, ah, single premium annuities. Well, CRATs can invest in them, okay? True. And there is this IRS ruling about this early payment. So under the terms of the CRAT, at any point in time, they're saying, so we've set it up. At any point in time, the charity can be paid an amount equal to 10% of your initial contribution, right? Plus, you know, a, plus you know, $100. So it can immediately pay that out. And that takes care of the charity forever. Okay. Then we have this annuity. And they say, well, annuities are taxed this way. First thing is your investment in the contract is considered basis to the taxpayer. Okay, correct. And they also say, and a CRT is considered to have the investment in the contract will be not the taxpayer's basis in that piece of property that was later sold to convert to the annuity, but rather it'll be the whole, you know, annuity cash you got from the sale. Okay. And then they say, and annuities are taxed that way so that every payment is considered to return a principal. And then the rest, you know, and some other portions considered the earnings. And you pay tax only on the earnings. And, of course, their implication with this is that by doing that, no capital gain, we get this annuity, and suddenly you're only going to pay tax on the earnings of that annuity, and you're going to get everything else back in. And we took care of you know, by giving away 10% of the proceeds, by just handing that 10% away right at the beginning, you're able to walk off with all of this, pay no tax. Since you expected to pay much more than a 10% tax rate, you are so far ahead, you know. Okay, great. Any of you who've worked with your remainder trust have probably seen at least 20 problems with what I just described. But the memorandum, which is in, and they actually reproduce a lot of the marking materials in memorandum 2020-006, that memorandum skips over a bunch of issues. This is the perfect example of how these programs that are the snake oil, right? Snake oil tax planning, how they make these look good and then try to intimidate the advisor who maybe has never dealt with a CRT before, has never done chair remainder trust, and if you've never done one, you know, you start reading this and they're, you know, they're citing PLRs, they're citing revenue rulings, they're citing code sections, and it looks great, except they really stop discussing a lot of key issues. For instance, a CRT does not pay tax on a capital gain, but the CRT maintains this, these layers, right? We have these various tiers of, of accumulated income. And how you tax the recipient of the annuity is based on, you know, they're considered to come out of those tiers first. So even though the CRT will not pay tax on the capital gain, which is very true, the beneficiary, let's assume we earn nothing and we just pay it out every year, you know, whatever our annuity rate was, which is kind of dumb investing, but let's say we did it. Uh, we'd still pay capital gains tax on every dollar of that until we paid out at least the amount equal to what we had received as the annuity numbers of as as basically as capital gains up front. Now the tiers go with the highest high income first, or highest tax rate stuff on top. So in this case, with an annuity because of the ordinary income, the annuity would just add to that tier. You know the earnings. That's all the CRT would add as ordinary income. It would have return of basis, but that return of basis is irrelevant. Right. What we're looking at here is our tiers, our tiers of income. And that means every distribution will carry out that income from the income portion of the annuity and a chunk of that original capital gain unless we go long enough to a pay down amount, 
you know, that is greater than the total earnings on the annuity and the original capital gain. Everybody who's worked with CRTs knows that's how it works and that that's why this is flawed even if it did work. But the IRS points out that there are a lot of issues. The problem is though, they lead the advisor who doesn't understand what they're reading to make leaps that the document itself never says. The document never says you will only pay tax on you know, the earnings on the annuity. The document never says that you'll ne that nobody will ever pay tax on the capital gain. They'll say the CR the CRT won't, which is very true, but it's not you won't. It allows you, the reader, to make that jump that this will allow you to totally escape capital gains taxes paid by anybody. And then the and then of course the promoter, if if you later try to hold them to it, says, Well, I didn't tell you that. How come you didn't know that? Yeah, it, it's bad. But they found a lot of issues the IRS does with this interesting reading. Uh, if you do that, you know, there, there's a lot of issues. So what the marketing materials told us right away was, you know, that the, we told you about basically how it says it works. It will be great. We're allowed to do it. But here's what we're trying to do. So the assumptions that they're trying to get you to make is that the beneficiary each year will pay tax only on the ordinary income portion of the annuity with the portion allocated to the investment of the contract being wholly non-taxable distribution to the beneficiary, something that it never says in the materials, but you make that jump. The capital gain will never be taxable to the beneficiary in any amount. Again, they never quite said that. And that the structure qualifies as a crack, giving you the immediate deduction benefits of a churro major annuity trust. Now they do kind of say that, but again, it's all kind of, right? They, they do it. Okay, here's the first problem. The IRS said, here's your first problem. This thing's not a crack. Uh, why is it not a crack? Well, they said there's a couple of problems. First thing is, oh, I forgot to say. The agreement also said that what you're going to get every year is either this percentage of what you contributed initially, or if it's more, what's paid out of the annuity. Okay. Now, in theory, if that was considered income, you could have a crutch or major unit trust that paid what's called a net income crut. But this isn't a crut. And uh, we can talk about cruts versus crats, but it's getting off topic. So the first problem the IRS says is this is not a fixed payment amount. Because the trust can pay the entire annuity amount. Because again, we want the entire annuity amount, right? I mean, that, that is kind of what, what we're trying to sell. Uh, that's not a credit. It doesn't qualify. It also doesn't qualify because that prepayment routine, they said they conveniently ignored the fact that those rulings that approved paying a charity early were for additional distributions of the charity. If you pay out the charity in its entirety at the start of a trust and the trust has no charitable beneficiary for the remainder of its life, you don't have a crack. They're saying, so this thing fails under two separate criteria. What's been pushed here fails as a crat, both because it, you know, it allows payments in excess of the annuity payment, and number two, it allows this prepayment. But even if those didn't kill the crat, we have other problems. The thing it's in its entirety invites you to take a position that's going, that ignores the annuity distribution rules and basically and the 644, the layers of income. In essence, now they say, you know, sometimes they can try to say, well, we're going to make the crat the owner of the, of the, of the annuity, but make the beneficiary of the trust, the beneficiary of the crat. So the insurance company writes a check directly there. Harris points out that's also got huge problems, right? You know, they, they, if they have the ability to assign the owner of the annuity and they could assign it to whoever they want, then that also means it's a disqualified crat. That's a power you can't give them. So, it's a real, real problem. Again, what's some of the science, and I've seen this, and I've not seen this program marketed, maybe some of you have, but the type of marketing materials are materials that I've read over the years many times. If you're not, if, you're don't, if you haven't gone into this, you haven't had to deal with this or with clients before, you haven't seen these program, this sort of things come out to you, uh, the thing you have to realize is almost always what's important is not what they talk about, but what they don't. This thing is structured perfectly to look like a fully reasoned analysis 
of this particular structure and why it works so wonderfully from a tax perspective. You're going to discover 99 times out of 100 with these sorts of snake oil scams, uh, you're going to get this huge opinion, right? All these documents telling you why it works and referencing all these things. What you're going to find, if you understand the area, anybody that understands CRTs would see this immediately, is they're spending tons of time proving things that nobody needs to prove. It's like proving LASIK is deductible, you know, as a medical expense on Schedule A. Well, it is. But ignoring the fact that the LASIK was being performed on your pet. Yeah, we need a human being here. But we're going to ignore that and, like, spend 50 pages discussing that we can deduct LASIK as a medical expense which is not an issue anybody's worried about. That, that one, we all should know that answer is yes. But they're going to spend tons of time dealing with things that are irrelevant. But to make it look like they've got this thing just nailed entirely, look how thorough they're being. And they're going to totally skip the key issues. Right? You've got to be careful. And then they are going to use this to threaten you. Well, you know, you know I know CPAs who've done this. You know, I, I've recommended this. No other CPAs ever ever said, you know, the minute you hear anybody tell you no other CPA has ever, yeah, those are your warning signs that you got a scam, right? The no other CPA has ever is your first sign of a scam. You know, they've, they've run into resistance before. They're using that to scare you and believe that you're going to lose the client. This is one of those cases where you've got to understand, you know, understand the structure and understand it independently of those materials you're being given. First, come to your conclusion about how this would work. So understand CRTs, CRATs, and everything in general, and then maybe consider what they're handing out. But don't go with their stuff first. They are leading you down a path to get you to totally ignore, you know, just like, you know, ignore, ignore that person behind the, you know, behind the curtain from the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, ignore that. Don't, don't pay any attention over there. Right? Look, look over here, right? It's just like a magician. They're going to do the same type of magic show, getting you to watch one thing when the real stuff's going on someplace else. Be very, very careful. Uh, in this case, this one, if somebody gets marketed this program, this memorandum uh, basically has recommendation to agents. They tell them flat out they should challenge it as a CRT immediately. If they've not challenged as a valid CRT, then they go through how they should say, well, anyway, you've got to deal with the layers because they ignore the layers and they just kind of skip it. What they're hoping to do, to be totally honest, and I suspect that's the case here, is they're going to want to get you as a CPA to do the tax return for the CRT. And oh, by the way, ignore this whole problem. Probably never introduce you the proper form for a CRT. Just have you do it on a trust, right? Or even not do it at all because it's an exempt organization. Maybe do a 990. Who knows? what they're going to want you to do. What, whatever mistake you make is fine because, you know, they're going to be perfectly okay with that and they're going to throw you under the bus when it's done. Like I said, it's perfect example if you read this. I love this memorandum because it's got the perfect example of the type of garbage that you get when somebody's doing snake oil pushing of a tax scheme. And they're going to try to intimidate you to go along with them. Uh, be very careful. Th this is, like I said, it's a perfect memorandum. I thought it was great. I have not seen this particular scam in the wild, but it I, I've seen one like ones like it for years that just kind of ignored major things. And it's been kind of funny. As one attorney I know has said from years ago, when a client walks in with a package or something like this, he said, well, you know what? You can pay me to look at this. But I can tell you right now, I've not found one of these yet that works. And it's going to take me, though, you know, at least 20, 30 hours at billing, at standard billing rates to go through this and write up what all the problems are. And, you, and, you know, and I expect to be paid, uh, retainer, please. Uh, or you can just accept the fact that the odds are this doesn't work. He said, my, my take is 99.9% .9 chance it doesn't work. But if you want me to look at it, you can pay me for it. You know, be, be careful there. It's just like, yeah, it's a mess. And yes, they're going to try to intimidate you to go along with it. Next up, another interesting topic to discuss. This is from Chief Counsel Advice 2020-26002. And this was issued on June the 26th of 2020. 
And this actually discusses, and the real issue we're discussing here is the statute of limitations when a taxpayer has filed a superseding return on a return that was filed on extension to begin with, and the superseding return is then later filed before the end of that extension period. Now, this has an interesting answer, but it really allows us to have a discussion right now of what in the world is this thing called a superseding return. Okay, You may have heard this discussed, many people discuss from time to time, this concept of a superseding return. Now, the concept of a superseding return comes out of a U.S. Supreme Court case from the 1940s. It was Hager versus Hel Helverly. And the issue becomes, if I file a tax return, let's say, my individual return, I file my individual return on in a regular non-COVID year on March the 1st, right? And on that return, I forgot to make an election that has to be made on the original return. So I need to make this election. I need to do this stuff. I go ahead and before April 15th, I file a, in the case of Hager versus Helverling, uh, I file an amended return before April 15th that attaches that election, right? And makes any other changes, maybe numerically I should make to the return related to that. Now the question becomes, is that the, is that the original return? Or is that thing I filed back on March 1st, the original return? Because this election has to be on the original return. And maybe, you know, the tax. Can they go for underpayment of estimated taxes based on that March 1st return? Or do they have to do it based on this later amended return that had a lower tax? And the Supreme Court said, you know what? The due date's April 15th. As long as whatever is there on April 15th, you could file 32 different versions of the return. Whatever is there on April the 15th is essentially the return that is considered the original return. Now, if the return goes on extension, so I put the return on extension to April 15th in a regular year, I file my return on June 1st, and then I file that amended return. Uh, and I know some people are screaming right now, you don't shouldn't say amended return, not amended return, not amended return. Hold for a second, we'll discuss. I file that amended return by October 15th, uh, then that still counts as my superseding return. Okay, for all of you screaming, no, 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 you put it on the original return. Calm down. The actual case law, the Supreme Court was very clear we're talking about an amended return. Now I realize that people do it on a second copy of the original return and mark it superseding in big letters. The concept of a superseding return per se is not discussed in the code. It's not ever discussed in this case law. It's an internal IRS reference for this special category of an amended return, right? You're revising the original filed return. Yes, the IRS these days generally will figure it out if you file on paper and mark superseding in big letters over everything. They will figure out that it's a superseding return. And again, the last one there before the due date if it's an original return, April 5th, if it's a return that was not an extension, then the regular due date, April 15th. If you did file for an extension, then it's the extended due date, even though you filed earlier. Okay. And it does step in place. So elections count. You know, if we're going to go for underpayment investment, we're going to look to that return. We look to that return for everything. But the question that this talks about is now, wait a minute. So let's go back to that extended return. I file it on June 1st of 20, you know, I file that on June 1st of, let's say 2016, which is a statute we're about to lose. Uh, and, you know, and then I file a superseding return on October 1st of 2016. Now, as you're aware, 2016 statute for timely filed returns or any return filed before July 15th of 2016 will end on July 15th of 2016. 20, right? We have that extended due date, right? So I should say filed by July 15th of 2017 would be a 16 return. Uh, so we know we've got that. Now the question is, if I did a superseding return in October, did that superseding return reset the date for running the statute? Because case law is very clear. With an amended return, you know, with an amended return, with an extended return, uh, 
the statute doesn't go doesn't start at October. That special rule is only for the returns filed before the original due date. Now we look at the actual date the return was filed, received by the IRS, and that's the date that starts the statute. So the question becomes, by filing a superseding return on October 1st, do I reset the statute? And the chief counsel advice concludes that no. That October 1st date does not change the statute for the IRS to assess additional tax, right? That's still by the original date. Now, if you did ask for a refund, there is a chance that we could still have a statute open for the IRS getting back that refund money for that particular change from the, uh, from the June 1st one to the October 1st one because it's the date it's paid back to you that they can claim it back. But what you don't, what the IRS does not do is they don't have the right to go after you for everything on the return. June 1st is still your date. So come July 16th, if the IRS does not come after you, we're, we're stuck. But the same thing is true about you. If you're filing for a refund on the 16th return, and you had filed the original return on June 1st, the superseding return on October 1st, uh, yeah, that, that statute is already started. Now, why is this important? Well, superseding returns are interesting devices. Again, because they give us a lot more flexibility. It is an amended return on steroids if it can be a superseding return. And we talked a lot about doing this if you've taken the courses on partnership taxation. If you have a bipartisan budget act partnership return. Now, we did get a little bit of a reprieve for 18 and 19 here recently, but once the program is in place for full, so 2020 will be true, uh, I really can't amend a partnership return under the Bipartisan Budget Act. I have to go through this unique and strange method of going for, you know, asking for administrative adjustment requests. And even if I do a push out, the change becomes a tax credit if it's positive for the taxpayer. In the year I push the change out, the credit's non-refundable can't be carried forward. There's lots of issues. But if I do a super, if I go on extension, and this is what a lot of people suggest, partnerships should all go on extension, even if you're ready to file on March 15th, because then once you're on extension and file the return on extended date, you have all the way until September 15th of that year you filed. So like the September 15th of the year you're filing in order to file that superseding return. So you'd have until September 6, September 15th of 2020 to go ahead and actually effectively amend the partnership return, even though it's a BBA return. If 2019 wasn't covered by the special rule that allows us to ignore BBA under the uh, revenue procedure we talked about a few weeks ago. Uh, but for next year, that works. A lot of people, you know, there have definitely been articles that have suggested that every return should go on extension merely to open up superseding return issues to cover any mistakes that might be uncovered a few months after the return has been filed, where we might discover, oh, we should have made this election. We can then use a superseding return. But it is important to note that superseding does not change the statute. Okay, And if you read this thing, it'll tell you why. They're probably right, because what really they're saying is, it's just treated as if this return you filed on October 1st, we're going to treat that as a return you filed back on June 1st. Right? We're going to kind of step it in for that purpose. Now, a couple of other things we got here with due dates. The IRS announced in their news release 2021-34, issued on the 29th, uh, essentially that the July 15th deadline is going to be the actual deadline. Uh, the Treasury Secretary Mnuchin had suggested as, er, as recently as the week before that maybe the IRS would consider extending. You know, he wasn't really leaning that way, but they might consider doing it. This made it very clear, you know, they have the authority to extend it under 7508 Cap A. But the agency now has said flat out, we're not going to do it this time. July 15th is the original deadline. You need to file for your extensions by that date or file the return. One or the other has to happen. Other deadlines also will end on that date. They will not be extended. That will include, as already mentioned, those 2016 tax return, any refunds there. Uh, you know, you may want to look at that. Some people, I think the odds of this happening at the Supreme Court are extremely low. Uh, simply because the law change that potentially invalidated the ACA uh, only took effect in 17. It's really difficult for me to see the court deciding that that a 17 law change that only that only took effect in 19 uh, could somehow have retroactively killed it back to 16. Uh, even the cir Fifth Circuit, when they upheld the appeal, you know, they upheld part of the appeal of the district court that said it invalidated the law. Uh, sent it back saying, we, we, you didn't analyze this about what parts of the law had to be invalidated, what didn't. 
I really don't think the time frame rule either was clear. So I think it's unlikely, but yes, there are a few people trying to do net best and income tax amendments just in case that's retroactively repealed. My take is it's unlikely. I would only do it if a client, you could inform a client about that option, uh, but I would suggest you do it only if the client agrees to it and you tell the client that they're gonna pay for the cost of doing this in any correspondence and it doesn't matter that it doesn't work. You know, if it doesn't work, that's not your problem. I'm not guaranteeing it works. I'm just saying if you want to do it, we can do it and we can file it, but we are being charged for this. So, you know, how do you feel about it? You know, and then you can decide how well it's likely to go. That's a whole nother discussion. But I thought I'd raise it because, yes, I've heard it discussed. Right. Uh, now, as far as this July 15th extension, again, now remember, the IRS still has the authority to extend it. Uh, you know, they may not. I suspect they probably won't but they could extend it, uh, you know, so keep your eyes open, you know, because they, they really were inconsistent at April 15th, you may remember. We had m multiple shots before they finally did it. Also, the other thing which we discovered late last week was uh, if you're still, if you have any 1045s or 1139s that you thought were due on June 30, because you actually followed the notice, they issued, uh, those also got extended by the original IRS notice 2020-23 that kicked those. So you still have time to follow those too. Just got to remind you, just, just in case you spent the, the weekend uh, prior to the end of June doing nothing but putting those together. Well, you could have actually waited a little bit if you had something else more pressing. But anyway, you still have time to do by July 15th, so it's not a huge deal. Well, wanted to remind you again, uh, we're, we're still, especially now here in Arizona, uh, you know, cer certainly in the, not, not really doing live sessions. In fact, I suspect that there are a whole bunch of states right now that I can't travel to, uh, even if we want to try to do a live session, uh, and even if you'd show up, which I think is also an open question for many of you. So anyway, but I will be doing a four-hour webcast for New Jersey Society on July 22nd, uh, and that can go on COVID or no COVID. Uh, you know, we're going to have a four-hour webcast. We're going to go over the laws that have changed since the last one I did for uh, New Jersey early last month. We're going to look at the changes in the law. We're going to look at what's happened since then. We're going to look at, you know, these things we talk about in the program every week uh, and kind of do that and spend four hours kind of doing a little deeper dive into these areas. If you're interested, you can go ahead and check on the New Jersey Society CPA's website. It is July the 22nd. Uh, I will be doing the update session. So if you're interested, be sure to sign up. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of July the 6th, 2020. Current Federal Tax Developments, again, brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and your State Society of CPAs. You can catch our regular update on the website, currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. If you have any questions or comments, email me, edzollers at currentfelltaxdevelopments.com. Uh, Twitter handle I've got, at, at edzollers, so you can go on there and just find me there on Twitter. Uh, also, follow the discussions on the State Society uh, Connect groups for the societies in Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, uh, Illinois and Washington. So if you have anything going there, you post a question there and I think I can be of help. I'll try to respond and keep my eyes open there. Uh, also, we have access to Cal CPA's tax talk group. You know, so you can take a look on those groups. If you're a member of one of those societies, you got access to them. It's a really great place to get some interchange with other people, especially for local law issues, right? If we're talking about state, you know, state law taxation questions. That's probably one of the best places to get your guidance if you have access to it. Well, you can join us next week. Hopefully, we'll see if I actually get a session out next week. I will warn you ahead of time. Uh, because this is effectively the April 15th deadline, and I'm going to have a few things you know, to juggle in that realm in terms of extensions and other details. Whether I actually get one out next week is much more questionable than this week. Uh, but hopefully, I'll get one out, and so we'll talk about that. We certainly have new things happening. And I'll be discussing those changes as they happen, and we'll discuss what's going on, uh, see how things run. And it's going to be an interesting rest of the year, uh, you know, as things happen. We expect when Congress comes back from their break. Oh, by the way, in case you weren't aware, Congress did extend the PPP loan program to August the 8th, but we have not yet had a signature by the president on the bill, at least as of the last time I checked. So we'll see if that gets signed into law. If it does, then we'll be extended to August 8th. That's still pending as of time recording this early on the morning of the 4th of July. So, you know, that, that's like a pending deal. So we'll keep an eye on that. Other issues, once they come back, we are expecting a new bill to come out before they go on August recess. And August recess is August the 8th. That's why that date was selected for the PPP loan program. 
uh, to continue on with the funding it already had. So we'll see if we get something. I expect we won't have it by the day that I do that session in New Jersey. I expect we may have it though shortly after that. So we'll keep an eye on that. There's lots happening. And so we look forward to uh, you know, having you come with us and uh, keep up week by week here as we talk about current federal tax developments.